PCA is a coalition of individual groups in cities around the region, primarily in, uh, in King County now, though we're starting to get interest from beyond the county for, uh, uh, for the work that we're, we're doing. Uh, so each one is a group of residents within a city that are uh, working with their local officials to try to inspire uh, action at the, uh, at the local level on, um, on climate uh, uh, to, uh, to address the climate crisis. We currently have 10 groups in the city. We began with uh, Bellevue, Mercer Island. Uh, we kind of realized we had groups sort of marching down the same path. So we came together, quickly found uh, interest in uh, similar groups that formed in Kirkland, Redmond, Seattle, Kenmore, Bothell, Woodenville, Sammamish, and Issaquah all have groups formed in, uh, in, in, in operation now. Um, there are groups forming or uh, in, in the process of forming now in the, in the south part of the county, Renton, uh, Buring, and Des Moines, and uh, several other groups are, uh, are beginning to come together. So we are um, largely aligned with uh, the K4C. We have some groups, some groups, some of our groups in cities that are not in K4C, many that, many that are, but uh, we are, you know, hoping to form groups in, you know, throughout the, throughout the county and, and uh, help support the, uh, the goals of the, of the K4C, which is the King County Cities Climate Collabor Collaboration that began in 2014 um, with, uh, I think, 12 cities. Now it's up to, I think, 17, uh, including the, the county um, that has um, uh, developed a climate action plan for the county and uh, set fairly ambitious uh, greenhouse gas reductions targets of 25% uh, reduction uh, beyond, below 2007 levels by 2020. 50% uh, by uh, 2030 and 80% by 2050, very much in line with the, the um, uh, Paris Climate Accord. So um, the, the K4C is striving toward those goals and uh, doing uh, action at the local level, and uh, PCA is, um, is in place to try to, uh, uh, to work with our local officials at the city and county level to, to help meet those, uh, those goals. Um, what we are, uh, uh, our, our schedule for today um, is I'm about to introduce Claire Waltman, who will uh, talk about the process for how PCA uh, came upon or settled on Kirkland, or uh, on um, uh, Portland as the, uh, uh, Kirkland, or where that came from, uh, but uh, how, how uh, they settled on, uh, uh, how we identified uh, Portland as the model for, uh, for uh, city, city and county climate action. And uh, we'll introduce our featured speaker, uh, Susan Anderson, from, um, from Portland. We'll take a, a quick little break and then hear from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, um, who is working at the national level for, uh, uh, for effective climate action. And, uh, and then we, uh, we'll hear from Megan Smith, who's uh, Director of uh, Climate and Energy Policy for King County. And uh, our founder of this organization, Court Olson, will uh, give a little uh, brief, uh, brief look ahead. We'll take a quick uh, restroom break while we rearrange chairs. And then we're going to break out into groups by city. And the elected officials and, and uh, staff members that are here will have a breakout session with Susan Anderson for, for further, um, further uh, Q&A and follow-up. But we'll try to get each city group, uh, and I think we Court, we will have signs around the room for where to go, so when we get to that point, we'll let people know, but we'll get each city group to have some time together to, to uh, uh, reflect on what was, uh, what was presented and, uh, and uh, discuss uh, where, we go, where we go forward. And then we will, uh, we will be done at 12.15, and uh, we will shoo everybody out this door because we've got to get all this cleaned up uh, by 1 o'clock for the, for the next uh, event that's, uh, that's happening in this room. So... Um, Again, uh, welcome, uh, thanks for being here, and let me turn it over to Claire. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Susan Anderson, uh, today. She's been a real integral part of the Portland Climate Action Planning, uh, and that's been a city that's really had significant success in lowering greenhouse gases. As most of you are aware, King County does have a strategic climate action plan, and the King County Cities Climate Collaboration uh, was signed in 2014. And this really forms kind of a framework for our, our area but we've really been disappointed in our overall greenhouse gas emissions. As you can tell from this slide, the population, I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, in blue has been going up for our area. Job growth, employment in red uh, dipped, of course, during the recession. The black line indicates emissions, and it's really been stable from about 2010. So we've really not had the lowering we would like to see. 
with this, the uh, People for Climate Action started uh, forming, trying to get more action locally. And we started looking at a lot of cities. And originally, we were very excited about the number of cities that had climate action plans. This is just a few, but there are many that have had climate action plans. But as we looked at them in more and more detail, we found out that they had plans, but they hadn't really gotten the reductions in greenhouse gas emissions that they were aiming for. One of the real exceptions to that was Portland. So if you look here, there are two things that I want to point out why we, there are many reasons why we really think that the Portland Multnomah County plan could be a real example for us here in our area. But there are two that really stand out. First of all, if you look at this slide, the blue line there is population. Population, it's been going up. The green line is the number of jobs. It has been increasing. But then if you look at the purple, they've really had success. They've lowered their greenhouse gas emissions by about 20%. So this is the kind of thing we would like, to, of course, to see in our area. The other thing is that their first climate action plan was in 1993. And again, I don't have a pointer, but that's on the left-hand side of the slide. The point when the greenhouse gas emissions started coming down was around 2000. So this really shows that you need to have a climate action plan that has measurable goals and that you reassess. And that's one of the examples that Portland has really shown us. So that brings me to Susan Anderson. It was under her direction that the city of Portland developed their first climate action plan in 1993. And several things are very, also very interesting about their plan. In 2000, she was a leader. She found monies that were both from private, foundation, and federal sources that found workable solutions. And these solutions involved residents and businesses. And then in 2009, she led the effort in creating the growth and development plans that focused in, partic in particular on equity in both the ur urban development and in the sustainability initiatives. So residents and businesses combined and also the equity for those portions of our community that really need it. Um, she left the city of Portland uh, back in October of 2018, but she's still working on uh, many environmental issues and particularly climate policy. So we're looking forward to Susan Anderson's talk today and hoping that she can help us find a successful plan for King County. So, um, good morning. So it's great to be here um, on a sunny Saturday morning and um, amazing to see such a big crowd um, on a, on a sun, uh, Saturday morning. And, um, and, and really amazing to me after working on this issue for literally about 30 years to see so many people taking action locally but also around the world. Um, such great news here in Washington State with 100% renewable legislation, which is amazing. <laughs> Um, and all your other climate um, and energy legislation that was passed or is still hopefully uh, being worked on. Um, it's so important and it's important because there's so much work to be done. So much work to be done at the federal level, at the state level, um, and definitely at the local level. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we're going to talk about how cities and counties can take action, why it's important. Um, Court, Olson, where's Court? He's in the back, back there, gave me a, a shout one day, I don't know, like six weeks or eight weeks ago, and asked me to come up, and I really wanted to be a part of this, because this is the same stuff that's going on in literally thousands of cities around the world. There's groups like this who are frustrated with um, the action that's being taken at the federal levels in their countries um, or, or in their state level and want to get moving at the local level. So um, I'll be talking in particular about what's going on in Portland, but you know, if I had three hours, I could tell you what's going on around the world, and there's a lot going on. Um, so maybe just a minute on who I am um, and what I've been working on until recently, um, as she just said. Um, I was the director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability for the city of Portland, and I worked for about more than 25 years. Um, it's nice to see some other gray hair in here, which mine would be probably, but... Um, uh, Anyway, that um, I've been working for more than 25 years on energy climate issues, um, urban planning, urban design, land use and transportation, and how those things all come together. 
Um, in 2000, the city created the Office of Sustainable Development, and when we did that, we brought together um, energy issues, a lot of the environmental programs, recycling, um, food issues, energy conservation, solar, things like that, all together. Um, it was sort of like a nonprofit in that um, they just paid for a little bit and then we attracted lots and lots of foundation dollars. So if your cities are interested in that, there are foundations out there who want to work on climate issues um, and or they want to work on social issues that are connected um, to climate issues. So um, there's some great opportunities for public, private and nonprofit um, collaboration. Then in 2009, um, City Council decided that they would merge this Office of Sustainable Development with the traditional planning department. And I had been a planner a long time ago and they asked me to lead um, that new department. And the purpose of that was to make sure that sustainability and climate and energy issues were actually core to all the work that was going on um, on land use, on strategic planning and zoning for the city. Um, and I'm telling you about this structural change because um, I just think it's really critical for the cities that you're in. Um, it's really important where uh, the work on climate and sustainability actually resides in the city government. Um, for some cities, it would be the mayor's office. Um, in Portland, um, planning was like the best place for us to be um, because that's where all of the issues, housing, transportation, land use, parks, jobs, you know, equity and other issues kind of come together in the streets for people. Um, and um, it allowed us um, to bring technical staff together from sort of a lot of different areas to work on these issues and also raise the visibility and kind of credibility um, of the climate issue because um, in Portland, uh, planning's kind of king. We're, we all think we're city planners. And uh, by putting it in planning, it gave it a lot more um, uh, visibility and kind of integrated it in with everything else. So anyway, I've been working on um, climate and energy issues for a really long time. I have degrees in economics and environmental science, which my parents told me were polar opposites and how did that make any sense. Um, <laughs> but that was a few years ago. And then I got a master's in urban planning because I, that was a place to bring it um, all together. Um, and my work is always focused on local-based community solutions. And I've done that because I believe local uh, government and uh, uh, local action is where it's at. Uh, back in the 80s and 90s, I thought that at that time, the federal government sure wasn't moving very fast on any of these issues. And if we wanted to move, we would really needed to do it at the local level. And um, little did I know, three decades later, we'd still be sort of in that same um, position. Um, but the work at the local level keeps moving, it prods the state, and the states can then uh, prod the federal government. There's a lot going on at the state level here in Washington, obviously, um, in Oregon and California, East Coast, and a smattering in between. Um, so I'm going to jump into some of the educational ba basics a little bit here. Um, so why um, local governments and why should they be taking action? Well, I think these are just some of the basics. Local governments are big energy users, so lots of buildings, water, wastewater. They're responsible for streets, um, transit, bikeways, sidewalks. They're responsible for zoning and making sure that people actually live and work where nearby transit. They enforce building codes and energy codes. Some of them own electric utilities, like a lot in the Northwest. Some don't. Um, and then they can bring people together. So gov government is often that place that can facilitate action and interaction among residents and businesses and can educate, can inspire, um, also providing technical assistance and providing incentives. So with this in mind, back in the 90s, I'm out of graduate school and I'm, I'm ready to go and I start working with the city of Portland and um, we pulled together some funding from, I think it was the uh, Danish AID. So always be looking for money out there. Um, it was Toronto and th three or four US cities and half a dozen cities from Europe. And we all got together and said, we're gonna do our own local climate action plans. Um, and that's what it looks like, great graphics. I cut that globe out and this is how it was in 1993. <laughs> Put it on there. Um, 
So at that time, we didn't talk about climate change. No one knew what we were talking about, um, and uh, they didn't understand it. And so instead, we focused on the benefits of things that people, real people, actually really care about. And those are things like saving money, saving money for city government, for residents, for businesses, creating local jobs, um, making your home more comfortable, making your office more comfortable. Um, and the action plans also would help us um, to clean up the air, um, provide more bikeways and transit and sidewalks in places that there weren't any. And overall, basically, it focused on trying to make Portland just a, a better place um, to live and work. And I was talking to someone right before, and they were saying, well, we can't really talk about climate change still in our community. Um, and uh, I get it, because literally, um, it's in Portland really only been the past six years maybe that I was able to get anything through where I featured climate change is the reason why we're doing it. Um, the issues I was just talking about, saving money, um, you know, healthy kids, clean air, those are the things that people really care about and I encourage you to continue to use those things at the core of what you're trying to do. Um, that's not to dismiss the climate crisis in any way. You've all seen this graph. Temperatures are rising quickly, and the science and the impacts are definitely a motivator for many. Um, you've also probably seen um, or personally witnessed some of this um, horrendous fires um, in the Northwest in California, flooding, um, huge storms, uh, heat waves. And um, I think finally, though, what's changed is that the media um, is really beginning to help our cause by connecting these issues um, with climate change. Um, and the media is also helping us by providing visuals for all of us to see people who care from all around the world. And it's people um, of all ages and from all cultures. Um, so with that as kind of general background, the three key points I want to make today is that the climate crisis is real um, and we got to move fast. Um, local action can make a difference, and it must, and significantly, um, it can have an impact on reducing emissions locally and a whole slew of those other side benefits. And third, that there are cities around the world for you to go copy from, share with, swipe those ordinances from another city, um, and that they're looking for you. And so um, being able to connect with those cities um, is a great opportunity. Um, before I dive in, my mom always told me that um, it's polite to do introductions. Um, so you all know a little bit about me, and obviously I can't have all of you uh, do introductions, but, uh, well we could, but it would, we'd be here till happy hour, so probably wouldn't want to do that. So um, I'm just going to ask a few questions, if you can raise your hand um, and answer. Starting with how many of you are elected officials, either from the city or county, so quite a few, that's great. Um, how, uh, your leadership is incredibly important and this stuff doesn't happen unless, unless we have champions um, like you pushing for it. Um, how about um, city managers, department heads, other city staff? Some of those. Uh, neighborhood reps. People from the neighborhoods, people from business, feeling, well, a lot of you might be from business, but sort of representing business interests, um, environmental groups that are, yeah, there we are. <laughs> um, how about um, social equity, racial justice, environmental justice? Nice, good to see. Um, and then all the other issues, housing, economic development, transportation, everybody's sort of good. Um, I just kind of wanted to know that because if, knowing that the elected officials are in the room, I can make some of my comments more towards that and, um, and not others. So uh, thank you for doing that, and it's nice to meet you all. Um, so let me jump into the Portland story. And to do that, I need to go back um, about 50 years, even before I was working on this. Um, and I think it's a story that's really similar to Seattle's and to some of the, some of the cities um, and many of your communities. Um, so when people think of Portland in the Northwest, Seattle and all of, all of the Puget Sound area, they think of pic pictures like this. They think of tree, you know, if you're from anywhere else, you think of trees and mountains and green and rivers and water and amazing beautiful place. 
and Portland is all that. Um, but it wasn't always all that. And this is pictures um, from the 60s and 70s, 80s. About half the days in Portland um, exceeded air quality standards. And there was lots of smog and lots of cars and leaded gasoline and not a very healthy place to live. And at the same time, just like in most US cities at that time, our downtown was in decline. Everybody was moving to the suburbs. Um, we had two major freeways that we had built, and you know everybody shuttled into the city uh, during the day, and then they all shuttled back um, at night. Um, we were building lots and lots of lovely parking lots and tearing down uh, buildings um, and parking garages we were building. Um, and then it kind of started to turn. In the late 70s, early 80s, um, we kind of woke up and things began to change. Um, at the state level, um, we had statewide land use planning. And what that did was establish rules at the state level that every single city in Oregon um, had to develop their own comprehensive plan. And that plan had to meet statewide goals. And they were things like you'd expect in any planning document around housing and transportation, economic development. But it also talked about environmental quality um, and even energy conservation. Um, and as part of that process, we needed to create an urban growth boundary. How many of you have heard of the urban growth boundary? So, all right, yep. So, and lots of places since then have done some kinds of similar work. Um, it doesn't just surround Portland, it surrounds the entire metro area that's on the Oregon side of the border. I'd really include Vancouver otherwise, um, and Camas. Um, but what it did was it provided certainty about where we could build about uh, to protect farm and forest lands. And you can see in that picture on the left there, um, the boundary's really clear. Um, <laughs> and it still looks just like that. Um, so we um, set the boundary, and that became the fundamental sort of um, structure for growth. And it allowed us to grow up and not out. And so the main purpose for doing this originally was to protect farm and forest lands. And the side benefit that who knew that this was what we were doing was that we were causing us um, to be able to have people live and work more closely, more densely, um, and able to have good transit and have it work, and actually reducing our carbon emissions because of that. So uh, back to the picture of the parking lot. At some point, um, people were pretty fed up and pretty upset that developers were tearing down buildings just to build parking garages. And so on this side was uh, to be built a 10-story uh, parking garage. And um, there was sort of a big revolt at City Hall. And instead, we built um, Pioneer Courthouse Square, which many of you have probably been to. Yay. <laughs> um, in the same way, um, public pressure caused us to shift the highway. I don't know if any of you were in Portland back then, but there used to be the highway. It went right um, on the waterfront. We moved that and um, created Waterfront Park. Um, but that didn't mean that we were um, really off the freeway thing. Um, there was a proposal for the Mount Hood Freeway where that arrow is. Um, and nine other freeways at that time were planned. And um, it, it just seems crazy now, um, because luckily none of those were built. Um, but it was at a time when that's what transportation planners were doing. And what it did was destroy neighborhoods. It destroyed neighborhood fabric and tore them apart. Um, uh, so luckily, um, our mayor at the time uh, was able to convince the federal government that we should take those freeway funds for the Mount Hood Freeway and instead build our first light rail line. Um, this picture here on the left is one of my favorites. Um, that was a free, we had already started building. That's one of the freeway exits that they just uh, stopped. It's kind of a cool symbol. We stopped in our tracks and we built light rail instead. Um, and we now have 60 miles of light rail um, in all directions of the city and more um, being proposed right now. We also have... <laughs> And I need to stop just for a second. All of a sudden, I'm hearing my daughter in my head. So I have three kids. And the youngest, who's actually in charge of the family, of course, um, <laughs> she would right now say, Mom, you're bragging. And, <laughs> and that's what I kind of hate about doing this, this, this uh, kind of talk, because we've been doing this for a really long time. And so we have a lot to talk about. Um, and you know, Seattle has a lot of these things, San Francisco, Boston, Austin, a whole lot of other cities. So. Um, 
She said I only get to brag two minutes a day when she was four years old, so. <laughs> That's not in my notes right here. Um, so um, streetcar, we have 16 miles of streetcar, and this is where the planner in me comes out. Um, we all know that transit isn't any good unless there's development nearby. So land use and transportation have to go hand in hand. Um, so at the time, in the 70s, we rezoned a whole lot of the um, areas for multifamily, commercial, and mixed use along the corridors, and in some areas increased uh, the density dramatically. Um, so how many of you have been to Portland in the Pearl District? So yeah, there you go. We all just go to each other's city for entertainment, I think, yeah. <laughs> So that's what the Pearl District was originally. It was the old railroad, railroad yards. Um, then with the right zoning, development incentives, and good uh, transit, it now looks like this. And there's thousands of people living there. And importantly, about 25% of the units in that area are actually for low-income households. And so the reason I'm, which is hugely important, um, and that'll be a theme through Anytime you talk to me, um, you can't do this stuff in a vacuum because climate change impacts everything, and it's got to be about housing. It's got to be, you know, it's got to be about people. It's got to be about raising people up and giving them training and helping them be a part um, of sort of this transition to um, a just and clean, you know, energy economy. Um, anyway, when you think about transit and land use, those things need to come together and. That's where it comes to all of you at the local level, because you certainly don't legislate urban form uh, at the federal level. It's really up to cities. Cities have the responsibility. Um, cities um, um, have the tools to do it. And uh, so that's sort of where we are right now in terms of Portland. We've kind of come a long way. We were a pretty polluted city um, not that long ago. Um, we've come a long way, and um, I'm going to talk specifically now about our climate action plan um, that was already mentioned. And there it is on the left, our first one. Um, that is the actual floppy disk I wrote it on. <laughs> Being in the tech world here, I knew that you'd all appreciate that. Um, so um, over the years, we uh, 25 years, um, we updated and improved the plan. We set more ambitious goals. Originally, we had a 10% reduction goal. We got there in uh, 2010. And that goal now um, in our 2015 plan is to reduce emissions 80% uh, below 1990 levels by 2050. So we started a long time ago, so we've been able to track. Um, emissions actually went up and then back down. So if we use 2000, like a lot of places do, our emissions would actually be about 30 something percent below um, where we started. Um, our goal then um, is to get to that 80%. And um, it's been um, a struggle um, and it's been a lot of hard work, but um, I think we've actually done pretty well in all these years. Um, as was shown before, we've uh, cut carbon emissions by 20%. Um, and at the same time, the rest of the U.S. Um, was up about 7 or 8 percent. I think it's now down to like 2 or 3 percent, so it's starting. I didn't keep the arrow going on my data, but it's starting to come down. Um, you can see from this slide, our population has increased by more than 35 percent. That's the blue line on top. Um, jobs are up 25 percent. That's the green line. And total emissions are down uh, 20 percent. Um, and that really just proves that the economy can grow and you can cut carbon emissions at the same time. Um, our average per person emissions since 1990 are actually down more than 40%. So most people don't know that. I'd say, you know, um, most people in the city uh, probably don't know we have a climate action plan. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people do. And a lot of people care about this issue. Um, but my belief is, it was a lot because of other environmental programs, land use programs, transportation, and wanting to get clean air. And that's why we moved in that direction. Um, but here's the reality. 20% uh, is nice, um, but it's, we've got a really long way to go to get to the 80% reduction that we need. Uh, so I think another point that's important is that all of our communities are growing. And I know you all are growing here just as fast as Portland. 
Um, by 2035, we expect 250,000 more people living in the city, in the city boundaries, um, and 140,000 new jobs. So we absolutely need to remember that energy use is connected to all that new housing and economic development and land use and transportation, and we need to have those issues um, come together. Um, so remind me of those who actually work um, not that the elect officials don't work, because they're working really hard, sorry. <laughs> um, in city or county government, and you all know this too. So a few people working, but, but how many have ever tried to work with the city or county department? Right. So you know that to get all the different departments on the same page, and all the different political leaders who change over time on the same page is really hard. So. Um, starting 10 years ago, we made a really focused effort um, to try and bring these issues together into alignment. Um, and because we wanted to be able to support each other's plans and not, you know, kind of be doing the opposite kinds of things. Um, and so, um, let me go back. We brought together, um, you know, transportation, environmental quality, and we also brought in the county for health issues because obviously the reason we're doing all this is for the health of the planet, but it's also for the health of us and the health and the long-term health um, of our kids. So um, success can't just be about carbon. Like I've already mentioned, um, it's got to be about everything from your bike plans to economic development to water quality, and those things all need um, to be able to align. And to do that, we developed um, something called the Portland Plan. And so um, this is the city's strategic plan. We'd never had a strategic plan. The new mayor, um, when I got the job in 2009, wanted to do a new comprehensive plan, and I'm like, well, that's only really a part of it. Why don't you do, act like a business? Why don't we do a strategic plan? Why don't we look at where all your pieces are together and see if we can't have them come into alignment? So the plan actually has city and county, but it also has the school district, and it also has the port, and it also has um, Oregon Health Sciences University, and a whole lot of others um, that are impacting the work that we do. Um, let me go back one more. So the development of the Portland Plan um, caused us not just to start focusing on the other departments and the other parts of government and business, um, it also caused us to really focus on the people. And what we found pretty quickly um, when we were looking at equity issues was that um, we weren't necessarily benefiting everyone. And, um, and in fact, some of our decisions may actually be hurting some people. So in terms of sustainability and climate, um, one thing that we know for sure is that even though we've done some really great work over the years, as has Seattle and a whole lot of other cities, um, you know, we have these great walkable, wonderful neighborhoods with great transit and parks, and we have um, these great programs around energy conservation and, and solar and a whole lot of other things. Not all of the residents were benefiting. Um, and this is particularly true of Portland's communities of color, um, lower income households. They often, in Portland anyways, have less access to transit because they're li many people are living in areas of the city that don't have good transit service. They don't even necessarily have sidewalks on the far out east part of the city, um, often are living in more polluted parts of the city, um, and are the ones who are most in need of saving money in terms of lower income families. So um, in response, when we did the last climate action plan, and I encourage you to do this, although it's, it's a really um, heart-opening exercise and, and, and it's a great way to build real community, um, we, we went ahead and pulled together um, all these different organizations that were representing people of color and other vulnerable populations. And as so many people are finally talking about, like with the Green New Deal, this transition, um, you know, from sort of this fossil fuel economy to the clean energy economy, it has to be a just transition. Everyone needs to benefit. Um, and so that means that um, more people of color and lower income households need to be the ones who get trained and get the jobs that are going to be out there. Um, and providing better access and financing for energy efficiency and solar and having, um, you know, electric vehicles. Uh, charging in all parts of the city, um, and so really just looking at where you're doing your work. Um, in creating the 2015 plan, we had a group of super dedicated individuals. Um, they helped us 
to advance political commitment. They helped us with equity metrics. So what does it mean? You know, how do we know when we're looking through this equity lens that we're actually making a difference? Um, and they just provided some great overall program guidance. Um, let me dive into the plan. So there, the 2015 plan has eight um, different climate action areas, and um, I will briefly walk through all of them. You can, I'll give you a website at the end so you don't have to take notes on all this. Um, the first climate action area is around buildings and energy. That's the obvious one. In Portland, it is 43% of our carbon emissions. Um, and over the years, we've had dozens of different policies and regulations, but mostly dozens of programs um, to help uh, encourage energy uh, efficiency and to use more renewables. Um, for example, here's one of my latest favorites. In 2018, we require now all homes that go up for sale uh, to disclose their energy use information. And it's like a miles per gallon sticker on your house. And you have to list it on the um, MLS uh, and anywhere else if you're doing it through Redfin or whatever you're using to, to advertise your house, you need to have this. And it provides a really easy way for buyers to compare homes. Um, every house that goes up for sale gets a similar review and a, a, a score so people can compare. And this is something that every city and county could do. Um, but but it took me more than 10 years to get this to happen um, because of the pushback from the real estate community and obviously and that takes political will and muscle to overcome it and I had worked with three different mayors over 12 more than that years um, trying to get them to do this. I think this was in our original, actually, 1993 plan. Um, three years ago, we had a mayor who decided not to run again. Yay, that's the, so. <laughs> best thing when you're working in a city is when, is when someone really is a proponent for your things and they decide not to run again because he then worked on a dozen different things that we really wanted um, to happen. So pay close attention to the politics when you're looking <laughs> Um, for a champion. Um, another, th um, another funny thing that happened that when we did this, so everyone screamed, and it was horrible, and there were articles in the paper about how this was, you know, going to ruin the real estate market, um, as if that could happen right now, you know. And um, what happened was literally within two weeks it became normal. And people started going, well, where's your energy score? And we started, and people were saying, well, it's listed, and, and you know, you have to have this energy score, and how am I going to, and people were starting to go, well, now it's like a trading item. Well, if you improve the energy score, then you don't have to redo the roof. And it became sort of a trading item, and I think that's just what we wanted to be able to have it have happen. Um, we have a similar kind of score for commercial buildings. Seattle has the same thing. Boston, Austin, they always go together. Um, uh, L.A., Washington, D.C., we all worked actually on these ordinances together, and that's another thing to keep in mind is um, swipe the, the best work from other cities. Everybody's really willing to um, help each other. Um, the commercial um, energy score um, isn't required just at time of sale, but it's required on all buildings over 20,000 square feet. Um, we have the software and the staff in our office to help. Again, that was probably a five-year process. Um, the Building Owners and Management Association and others were like, this is way too much work. We're not going to be able to do it. It passed. Within a year, they're all doing it. They're actually, more than half of them have come up and thanked me because they now actually know how much energy they're using in their buildings. And in a way, they can compare it to other similar-sized buildings across the nation um, and with similar weather uh, to be able to see what they, where they should be at. Um, another example, and this one relates to the embodied energy in building materials. Um, as I mentioned, Portland is growing really rapidly, and like many of your communities, um, with that gro growth comes uh, demolition. Um, and often it's um, older homes um, or really small homes, and some are, are in disrepair, but many of them aren't. Um, in response, we now require any home that's going to be torn down that's over 100 years old, it has to be deconstructed. It can't just be knocked down. Um, so all the valuable wood, all that amazing old growth stuff can be pulled out and then uh, the rest can be recycled. Um, as a result of these new rules, there's been several new companies start up, so lots doing deconstruction. Also um, three or four who are now selling the materials. 
um, we did, we, we kind of anticipated that there would be a lot of jobs with this, so we did training beforehand, um, and we focused on women, um, people of color, and formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, and nearly all of them, <laughs> I'm just so pleased to hear people appreciate the social aspects of this, because usually it's such an environmental focus, it's just, it's, this is great. Um, <laughs> So nearly all these people got jobs right away. And um, as you can imagine, when we took the results to city council after the first pilot to convince them we should do this and really make this legislation, um, they cared about the, you know, the environmental impacts and the climate impacts and the energy impacts, but they really cared about the personal stories of the individuals that were learning new skills, and those stories were amazing. Um, so going in and working with your elected officials and just talking about climate and energy and waste reduction is, is gonna get you some of their attention, um, but telling stories and building broad support for your program really happens when you make it personal. And so this is something we've learned and now we're, we're kind of along the same lines. Um, this thing is now on steroids in a whole different way. Um, last November, Portland voters approved a ballot measure to establish the Clean Energy Fund, and it will provide between 50 and $70 million a year for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. But the focus is not just that, because we've had traditional programs like that available um, through the Energy Trust of Oregon and through the utilities, um, but this one is focusing on job training to make sure that we have sort of this transition. The program's funded through a 1% surcharge on retail sales of large companies, and um, hopefully it'll be something that a lot of other cities uh, copy very soon. This leads me to talk a little bit um, about uh, the difference between policy and regulatory approach, sort of the hammer, um, and um, the kind of hands-on action. If we're gonna get to our carbon reduction goals, all of our communities really need to do both. We need this policy and regulatory kind of approach, but we also need, um, so actually let me give you a couple examples of the policy. Those are the things at the local level that I was just talking about. So uh, uh, the residential and commercial energy scores. At the state level, we need policy changes like the 100% renewables, uh, legislation that happened here, closing coal plants, uh, more stringent energy and building codes, um, cap and trade, all of these things um, are necessary. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think we need what I call uh, market-based or behavior change programs. And these are things like education and technical <laughs> assistance, financial assistance programs, and the city investments. The city, you know, each of your cities has substantial amounts of money. Always not enough, but, but they have substantial amounts of money, and there's investments in bikeways and sidewalks and um, all of your facilities. So you gotta have both. You have to have the policy and the programs. They kind of feed each other. Um, and you don't get the policy change overnight. This renewables thing, as you all know, many of you worked on it, 100% renewables didn't happen overnight. To get the policy changes um, that we're seeking, I think we need a really large base of people who care about it. And to get a really large base of people who care about the issues, they have to be personally connected to it. So you want people who have been able to um, drive less, ride their bike, um, be able to take transit, be able to walk to the things that they need. You want them to have been recycling, you want them to have been involved with energy efficiency pro programs because um, from a political at the state level, definitely, and at the local level, it's been my experience that um, other than maybe some of us in this room, very few people wake up in the morning and go, what can I do about climate change? I'm gonna go to City Hall and I'm gonna go talk to my congressional de delegation and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna march down to Olympia to make, you know, and demand systemic change. Um, that may be normal for some of us, but most people, <laughs> Um, they take action in their everyday lives, in their homes, and at work, and in transit in between, and if you want systemic change and new laws, then people who have participated in those local programs are much more likely to be supportive um, and push for those issues. Um, one more issue. Uh, it's something I want to talk about, because once 100% renewables came, I had people come up to me and go, we're done. Yeah, well, we got it, we got 100% renewables. And from my perspective, 
um, it's essential that we don't just focus on 100% renewables. Um, and the reason is uh, we really need to focus on energy efficiency too. We want our buildings and our cars to be as efficient as possible. We want them to just, to just sip energy. We want them to use the least amount possible. And then we want to use renewables for all of the energy that we actually need. Otherwise, we're wasting a lot of money and a lot of resources. Um, over the past... 40 years, um, energy efficiency has saved 30 times the amount of energy that we've gotten from all the renewables. So they go hand in hand. Energy efficiency is almost always cheaper. Um, so just like in your own home, you want to do the things um, that make most sense. Um, I love solar. Joined the Oregon Solar Energy Association in the 80s. Um, but wind and solar get all the headlines because they're fun. And they're cool to look at. And they're visible. And energy efficiency is like, kicked in the corner because it's messy and no one really understands it and it's hidden in the walls and it's, you know, it's in equipment and such. And so, um, and it also feels like we're giving up something instead of getting something shiny and new. And so I think people often will skip the energy efficiency work and go right um, um, to solar or go right to um, just investing in renewables. Um, Another point about that is, besides wasting money, is the mining. So we don't, everything has a, you know, a line that goes back in time. So to get all those materials for solar um, and to get all of the, uh, for solar components and for batteries, that's a lot of mining, and we don't need to be doing that more than what we need to be doing. Um, increasingly, we're going to have a shift, and we're going to need all that electricity savings from our bu buildings, because we're going to need all that electricity to, to run our cars and to run our fleet and all of the other things. And so we don't, we could, if we needed this much, we could just go buy this much more, but how much smarter would it be to cut in half what this is and then be able to have that investment uh, for the rest? Um, thanks. So I keep doing asides here and then Court's going to tell me I'm running too long, but uh, as a, as a planning director for Portland, you have to know that this is so odd to have a whole bunch of people, like, clapping for me. <laughs> They're usually yelling at me. Um, yeah. <laughs> which, which one? No. Um, so a fun program, just to say that we are doing things. So um, a fun program that we have going on in Portland um, is Solarize Portland. We help neighborhoods um, do... Uh, bulk purchasing, which you could do here, any of, the, any of your neighborhoods. Um, get a bunch of dozens of neighbors or even 100 neighbors together. They all do solar at the same time. We help get them a better price. Um, safety in numbers, too, if they aren't sure they want to do it, but all their neighbors are doing it, they'll jump in. Um, lots of, so we started this like 10 years ago. Um, and recently, actually, given limited funding, we're not doing this anymore because from an equity perspective, we were focusing primarily on middle and upper middle class white people in the city, and we need to be also focusing on everyone else. And so we've shifted our resources from focusing on single family homes, and now we're focusing on um, community solar. Uh, the next year, the plan is land use and mobility. Um, where the primary goal is to make Portland a place where 90% of people can live in what we call complete neighborhoods. And those are neighborhoods with great access to transit, um, schools, parks, shopping. Currently about 65% of residents live in those kinds of neighborhoods um, where they can easily walk or bike um, to meet all the needs that they have, whether it's coffee or beer or a restaurant or the cleaners or the library or whatever it is. Um, this is super important, about, super important because about 40% of Portland's carbon emissions um, are from transportation. Um, we did this map, um, and it shows where complete neighborhoods are in the city today. So uh, mostly near the center city, uh, uh, the central city, and the inner east side, and that's all the yellow areas. The outer east side and the kind of rolling hills of the garden of Portland, I call it, um, on the west side, they have a really, really long way to go. Um, this map has had a ton of impact um, in so many areas and has totally changed how we make investments in infrastructure. So now we're, as a result of this kind of mapping, and also we did overlays of income, education, um, renters, race and ethnicity, and began to see a picture of where our investment was going and where it wasn't going. Um, so we're beginning to invest more um, low-income housing in the yellow areas so that lower-income families um, have access to the greatest neighborhoods. 
and we've increased density in those areas. On the flip side, we're pushing for better transit, sidewalks, bike paths um, out in the areas that are purple. It's really a great visual. Um, at planning meetings like this, I'll have people come up to me with our map and say, "This is why you need to be doing this in our community, because, you know, in our part of the part of the city." So it's a great kind of educational tool. Um, so I really encourage you to do it for your city. Um, the other major transportation goal in the plan was to reduce vehicle miles traveled by 30 percent. Um, and to do that, we need to shift more people, obviously, from driving alone um, to transit and walking and bike and bus service and such, um, and also to more light rail. Um, this project co opened a couple of years ago, and um, I live about in the middle of that dotted line. I now have a 12-minute commute to downtown at rush hour. That used to be a 35-minute bus ride, um, a, about the same car drive, and then you had to, you know, or longer. Um, or for me, maybe a 45-minute bike ride. Um, so we're also expanding uh, the streetcar loop. So um, it now goes all the way around um, the downtown. Um, and as part of the last light rail line, we built a new bridge across um, the Willamette River. M many of you maybe have seen this. It's called Tillicum. Um, you can walk across the bridge. You can bike. You can take the bus. You can take the streetcar. You can take rail on it. You can skip, dance, run across it, but you cannot drive your car across it. Um, and I love that picture. I always use that one first. Um, two more key parts of transportation. So not everybody can take the bus, though, um, and not everybody can, uh, can get on a bike. Um, so electric vehicles are coming. They're coming quickly. Um, they absolutely need to be a part of the strategy. Um, uh, we found in interviews, especially the past two years, and a lot of our equity work, um, that many women, many youth, um, older people, people of color, they don't feel safe at night being on the bus. And um, that's a, you know, we have to think about um, everyone when we're looking at these transit solutions. And so EVs are going to be a part of our strategy. Um, everything from permitting to where we put charging stations, all of that, um, you need to have that as part of your plan. We also are connecting that with our autonomous vehicle strategy, which is coming rapidly. Um, and, uh, but that's a whole other presentation, so I won't do that now. <laughs> Um, in terms of bikes, um, accessible um, and safety is essential. Um, I think we're now at 8% of people riding their bike to work. Um, so for Portland, it's been um, a really key strategy for decades. Um, it's also a big part of our economic development strategy. So we now have thousands of people working in the industry. So all of these things kind of um, are interrelated and come together. You can see that all of this transit and bike improvements have helped to reduce vehicle miles traveled in Portland. Um, and so we're going down at a quicker rate. And so all of that is how much gasoline savings, basically, Portlanders have back in their pocket. Because every dollar you're spending, at least in Portland, there's no, there's no refineries or anything, pretty much is just exiting that dollar out the community. And when you're not spending it on that, you're able to spend it more locally. Um, after transportation, solid waste, um, recycling. Uh, we recycle about 70% of all of our waste. Um, one of the things that happened uh, that uh, changed rapidly to get us to that 70% is that households now have every week recycling collection, which like a lot of you probably do, um, every week yard and uh, compost collection, food scraps. But garbage is only picked up every other week. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, so that one took me about 10 years. Um, uh, two things happened, well, three things happened. The first thing that happened is everyone screamed. And then, then what happened is that residents overnight, literally within two weeks, reduced the amount of garbage by 35%. So a, lo a lot of cities will you know, switch and be able to now pick up composting and such. But if you don't take away the can every other week, um, once you do that, they, they have to figure it out. You have to figure it out. You can't fit it all um, in the garbage can to be overflowing. So the other part of it, and we didn't know this was going to happen as much as it did, is because tipping fees for garbage are a lot higher than tipping fees 
um, for all of the compost that was before going into the garbage. Um, so we've been able to either lower or keep garbage rates the same for seven years. And so I don't know any other utility, you know, electricity or whatever, um, that's been able to be stable rates. Um, we also have a great program here for businesses. We help them with recycling, energy conservation, environmental uh, programs, transit, um, and you know how to get bus passes for their employees. We do ads because everyone wants to see their company's name in the paper, and this is what pushes them to get certified um, as a sustainability at work business. Also attracts new clients when they have the little sticker in the window. Um, the next area of the plan is urban forestry and uh, natural systems, like many of your, this is more on the, um, you know, so we don't do everything we need to do and we have to adapt. And so being in the rainy Northwest, we're having more and more uh, 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 stronger storms. Um, lots more stormwater runoff, runoff, that's always been an issue, um, but now I think it's even more of one. We have stormwater rules around um, new construction and then we also have a new rule that we just finished right before I left on the central city plan that says any building over 20,000 square feet has to have um, an eco roof. Um, so we also are expanding our urban forest. Trees are obviously a big part of the carbon um, equation. The next area is food and agriculture. Um, we focus on ways to promote uh, low carbon intensive foods. So a little odd for government to get into what people are putting on their plate. Um, but we have um, recommendations. When I first tried to do that in 93 as sort of the intern, they, the mayor just shooed me away. And, so we're not telling people not to eat meat. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that it really doesn't make a difference whether it's vegetable and grains versus dairy and meat. And um, we also should be developing actions to eat local. Um, that said, most people think it's about eating local. And 85% um, of the carbon emissions coming from food actually comes from the production of the food and packaging and production is not the delivery and transportation. So both are important, um, but what you eat is actually more important than how far it comes from. Um, you can see from this graph here, that's supposed to be a lamb, it looks like a goat. Um, <laughs> lamb, the, you know, methane emissions. Um, so meat, much higher emissions per calorie, um, going all the way down to beans and grains. Um, I know for some people it's just, it's just a stretch, and to put that kind of thing in a government plan seems like um, a little much, except that food production is a huge part of the total emissions. Um, you know, it's not just the emissions that you add up in your city, how much, you know, electricity we use, how much gas, it's all the stuff we buy. And so that's like we have a whole nother plan focused on consumption and how we actually consume because, um, you know, the. All of the pollution that's going on in China, a whole lot of it is our fault. Um, we're the ones that are buying that stuff. So I think you need to think about um, what you're buying. Um, and then finally, uh, because of this slide, which is not easily to understand at first, but the meat eaters are on the left, and they have a much larger carbon footprint from food, and the vegetarians and vegans are on the right. So keep this in mind if you are one of those fast bike riders who are zooming around town and you eat a lot of meat, because you might have more emissions than your car driving vegan friend. <laughs> and, and you may just think like, oh, that's funny, huh? No, but it's true. And so, um, I mean, that is a huge difference in those are in uh, tons of carbon. So you can, when you're mapping your carbon footprint, look at the kind of food you're eating. Um, other actions in the plan related to food, um, community gardens, you all have lots of those here too, I'm sure. And then we updated the zoning code. And again, another great thing of having sustainability and planning together um, so that we could update um, to address barriers to um, food production and sales in the neighborhoods. Uh, the next section of the plan is on community engagement. If you're doing a new plan, um, my recommendation is don't weave it in through the whole thing. Pull it out as its own separate section because it was getting lost as part of transportation and part of the building section. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that um, that, that community engagement was a key component of what we were doing. We have something called the Climate Action Now uh, website, super helpful. We do tons of fairs. We have these b three big fix-it fairs that we um, hold in middle schools around um, the city. Thousands of people come and attend, tabling at lots and lots of events. Um, we have something called Repair PDX, 
where people can bring in anything from a broken toaster to a sewing machine and get them fixed by volunteers. Um, we have a campaign called Be Resourceful. Um, this one is a really practical site. We don't talk about climate change here at all, um, but it will impact that. And specifically, it's a much broader message about um, providing people with practical ideas and simple solutions to the kinds of things they need to do to save money, to where they can borrow tools, how do they conserve water, how do they conserve energy. And it's all done um, with a map, so you can just click on your part of the city and then you can find both government resources, um, private uh, businesses, and nonprofits to do that work. Um, that's the website in case any of you want to resourcefulpdx.com. Um, another important part of community engagement it's, one of the, it's just been a really fun program, too, because the businesses all got to be involved, and we don't, we, you know, it's kind of buyer beware. We're not screening them and saying, this is the best one, or this is the best place to get your new bike fixed, or whatever, but everybody's on there, and I think it's, it's really helpful. Um, as you're doing your, your climate action plan, um, we had, for community engagement, um, about a half dozen different groups um, organized by topics, different committees, one on buildings, transportation, food on adaptation and climate preparation. Um, and then we had one on equity, which was hugely important, um, helping us uh, you know, to figure out what kinds of areas we should be looking in to make sure that all people were benefiting from the plan. Another website, this one's way too long, so um, you can just go to uh, Portland, portlandoregon.gov slash BPS. That's the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. And from there, you can find um, all of these different ones. To finish up, um, two more sections real quick. This one's on climate change preparation and adaptation. Um, what, we, what do we do as all the weather starts changing? And then we have more severe storms. We have fires. Um, this section actually grew from about six pages into two huge documents, um, and they focus on all of the climate change impacts. Um, so the impacts on our buildings, the impacts on infrastructure. We had a, uh, a sort of resiliency exercise recently where we brought in the people who are working on transportation and water, um, fire, and the engineers and str strategic strategic people that were all working together. They weren't talking to each other. And um, one of the main roads that we really needed to make sure if there was water or wastewater pumps failing or because of storm issues, um, the main road to go there was one of the ones that they weren't even concerned about. And so all that really helps to having your departments um, talk to each other and also focusing um, on human health. And so this was the importance of having the county, um, the county does all the social and health programs um, in Portland, having them be a part of this. Um, the final section of our plan is walk our talk. Um, it's what can we do at the local level within city government, within county government. Um, for example, we've, we're now saving $7 million a year on electricity and natural gas bills. Um, and this is because, well, one, because we've been doing this for a really long time. Uh, and we were doing it to save money. Um, but, we, but we kept track of it. Um, keeping track and being accountable about it is super important because you need to show your success. Um, we also provide, uh, produce um, some renewables on site um, and buy um, renewable energy credits for the rest. We have 40% of our cars now um, that are electric vehicles and we've converted all our lights um, to LEDs. We have this great project, one of my favorites, that I affectionately call Poop to Power, um, <laughs> where we use waste methane from the wastewater treatment plant. It generates now a million dollars of electricity um, so that's something any city could do, anybody who owns a wastewater plant. A lot of them are just flaring the gas. You could be generating power. And we had so much gas that, um, <laughs> big city, growing city, right, um, that we are now making renewable natural gas. Um, so we're making renewable gas for vehicles and selling it for about $2 million a year. So great opportunity there. Um, another fun project, one of the, my last example, is um, small in-pipe hydro turbines. So our water's up at the Bull Run, it all just runs downhill, we don't have to pump, it just comes into the city. Um, those pipes put in little tiny turbines, and so we're generating electricity that way. And the reason I wanted to bring up this example is because Lucid is a, is a local company, and we found over the years that by promoting sustainable products and technologies and services, and having a market locally, we've actually built up this incredible um, uh, economic uh, kind of engine focused 
on green and sustainable um, technologies and services, and those are now being exported really internationally and nationally. Um, so we have hundreds of companies who are working on energy efficiency, on wastewater, on recycling, on stormwater management, and no doubt your cities have a lot of those um, same kind of companies. You all have, you know, we all did the green building work um, together in all the cities, and Seattle and Portland were, were nose and nose to who could do the ordinance first. Um, you all, Seattle did. Um, and so what I did was did, at that time we didn't have things quite as fancy as we went up and took a video of the mayor challenging our mayor to adopt um, the green building ordinance because Seattle already had done it. So do those kinds of things. Um, we have kind of a weird side. Um, we have a whole international economic development campaign called We Build Green Cities. And um, city elected officials go with these companies uh, nationally and internationally, um, you know, architects, developers, um, solar companies, wind companies, and others, and, and it's really become core to the economic development uh, strategy of the city. And my final slide, um, it's about accountability, um, and it's about storytelling, and um, once you look at all the things that you've done, and you know, I was talking to a few people before, and they're like, oh, well, we don't even have our plan done yet, and, this, and yet you've all done some amazing things already. Um, begin to account for those. Put them all together. It's essential that you're able to tell your story. We have 171, for, because we have all those committees, we have 171 actions in the 2015 plan. Um, every year or so, we publish a report on the actions and how we're doing. About 80% of those are on track. Um, I've probably worked with and side by side 100 different cities, nationally and internationally, on this issue. Every one of us agree that um, the accountability is the most important part, being able to tell your story, having good solid data. Um, it's also a great tool to get the laggards to act. So if you know that this is going to council and you are the transportation department or you're the housing department or you're the transit authority or the local utilities and you agreed that these were the things you were going to do in the next five years and you haven't quite gotten to it, there's a lot of movement there in that last six months before we go to council <laughs> because that's a very public, a very public affair. Um, so we go to council, but we also go to the local media. We do um, you know, editorial boards, go to, go to neighborhood meetings, do things like this. Um, I'm actually here because people that actually work in the department still were like, could you just go do this for us up there? Because we're, there's too much going on. Um, so that's it. Um, lots of information, amazing stories. Again, um, I hate the part where this sounds like a brag fest about Portland. New York, um, San Francisco, most of the major cities in the country are right there pushing each other. Um, you all have this opportunity, and um, I can help you guys a little bit to connect with other cities from around the country that are doing some of this work. There's a coalition of Northwest governments that are working on it. Um, if you're not a part of that, um, you want to steal and swipe all the policies and programs you can. You don't need to invest all, invent all of this, and um, I'm just really excited to um, start learning from all of you, so thank you. I just had a question about plastic. What are you doing about plastic? So we got this recycling program, and they're shipping, they were shipping all the plastic to China. <laughs> and so China's refused to take that plastic, so I'm just wondering what the plan is. Well, um, all the cities are pretty much in the same spot um, across the nation, although a few are leaping ahead and saying, well, we just got to come up with facilities in the U.S. to take this stuff. And so that's starting to happen. Business plans are starting to be created um, to do that. Um, China's kind of getting uh, a bad rap about all this. I mean, it's our stuff that's going there, and it's our stuff that's not clean, and that's why they're not taking it. It's got all sorts of contaminants in it. And so I think it's going to, over time, um, uh, make some changes. And then we're doing the same thing a lot of other cities are and looking at how can we um, reduce the amount of plastics going into the landfill? Okay. 
And um, our governor was able to sign four bills last, this week. He chose the community called Rainier Vista, which is kind of a low income, kind of mixed area. The idea was kind of to showcase that the environment matters for everybody. However, that day probably out of 1,003 of us were African American. So how are you going to talk about the equity? How you, because those are the people who are affected most and they are not in the process of it. So mm -hmm. how are you going to be including everybody? Great, thank you. Um, it's probably uh, the, the most learning experience and the most important work I, that I've worked on in the past five years is how do we, how do we broaden um, um, the discussion? How do we ensure that everybody's being a part of it? And part of that is opening up the discussion to again, not just be about environmental issues. It's gotta be about the people that are being affected. And so we've, <laughs> developed a tool in-house in the planning and sustainability work. So every project we're working on, we have sort of a series of questions that we're asking about, you know, who's going to benefit? Who's going who's to be impacted here? Could we be doing this in another area of the city? How, you know, how will this work? And um, to do that is bringing in um, uh, both older people, younger people, people of color um, into the conversation. It's also in how I've hired. So the past five years, I've really focused on hiring people of color within my organization because if young people don't see themselves, they don't think that that's something that they can be, be working on. And so we found that for a lot of our work, if you have a great marketing person for some of this work and someone who's a great communicator, I can teach them the technical stuff. And so they didn't have to actually be in the environment um, sort of the environmental, you know, movement to be able to be good at some of this work. So thanks for that question. What's the plan for getting Portland off of fracked gas? What is the plan? Um, <laughs> we need all of you to pretend you're from Portland, come down. Um, one thing that uh, we did, again, with that mayor that decided not to run again, um, was we had, it's, it's related to this, we had proposed um, a company from British Columbia going to put a huge facility um, at our port to transport with trains going through the city, um, uh, LPG, off to going to Asia. And um, so part of the stopping frack gas is trying to stop the demand for it and having it go through our cities. Um, so we're local government, we can't stop international commerce and national commerce, but we do have zoning. And so we went and um, I looked carefully at our zoning code for that area of industrial land and found out we could, in part of the zoning code, say no fossil fuel export, blah, 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 blah. And we convinced half, of council, half plus one of council to, to, to go there, so um, we were able to stop that facility. So huge issue. Um, but as cities, we can do what we can do. Thanks. Hi, I live in a bedroom community 25 miles east of Seattle, and our mayor and city council are very addicted to growth, growth, growth. There's too much money for them to be, to be made from every single house that is sold. So anyway, do you have resources how a smaller community can start to turn the tide? Should I get involved with city government or should I just keep talking to the mayor or? You should definitely get involved. Um, it, it, people are always amazed. Um, so Portland now has, I don't know, 670,000 people. And individual people going in and meeting with individual council maker, mayor, members actually does have a huge impact, um, I think. Um, having 20 people go in together is even better. Um, and having business champions, um, large businesses in town, small businesses in town, um, find the influencers in your community, having them be a part of it. And that's sort of the, the heavy side of it. On the other side of it, um, young people in, we found, um, so Nike and Intel are mostly out in the suburbs, most of the, in, near Portland. But the people who are moving to come work here from the Bay Area and from everywhere else, just like they're moving here, want to live in Portland because they don't want a huge yard. They don't want this thing. They're, they're 27 years old or 34 years old and they want urban living. They don't want to get in their car. They don't want to do these things. And so it's only been in the past three or four years that the suburban areas, because they were realizing we had a reverse commute going on for new people moving into the city. Um, the suburban areas actually are like, 
we need to have some, you know, I call them fake little downtown, you know, it's, we need to have, and, but they're super important and we need to have these places where there is townhomes and, and smaller places and, and especially um, for younger people who can't get into the market otherwise, you want that as part of your community. Thanks. Hi, on your trend graphs, um, at the beginning of the graphs, uh, the emissions are tracking upward right along with the uh, population and employment, and then it looks like pretty suddenly the emissions start going down while the others keep going up. Right. What changed? Um, a lot changed. Uh, so we, we were kind of, we were a little bit below all the way till 2000, um, the rest of the US. We weren't, but we weren't below where we were in 1990. Um, we had a program, a community, uh, uh, basically it's a 3% charge on all electric and natural gas bills um, that took all the mon that money that the utilities used to be using for some of their energy conservation programs. All that money went into the Energy Trust of Oregon. Huge impact on commercial energy efficiency, industrial energy efficiency. Um, we had light rail come on. We had more transit. Um, we had uh, all of those things just sort of kind of converged around 2000 and we began um, slowly to shift off, we shifted from coal to natural gas originally, and now we're starting to shift um, a lot more from natural gas um, to other renewables. Hi, um, I'm from Burien, and we have for our solid waste, we have a, um, a regional uh, company that deals with recology, and so right. most of South King County has that company. When you made the change, and right now we're, we're taking recycling every two weeks and garbage every week. So when you made that switch in Portland, was this an ordinance that was passed? Did you work with the, reg or the, with the regional authority or whoever the company right. was that was doing it? How did you make that happen? So um, in Portland, we're like a, a, a crazy capitalist free-for-all in terms of garbage. So we have, when we did this, we had like 28 different residential haulers still with franchise little bits. There were families from, uh, when I first got the job and I got garbage, they all thought I was Italian, so it kind of went well, <laughs> but with a lot of those families. Um, and uh, uh, anyway, uh, uh, and then commercial hauling, all you have to do is have a truck and get certified. And so we probably have about 45 different commercial haulers um, to make this change, but we regulate them all. And so out of, and out of my department. Um, and uh, so we were able to, um, Convince. We did it through pilots first for two years. We had some different parts of the city, you know, very different parts, um, different kinds of, of uh, different hauling companies, all kind of get used to it. Um, and then we did lots of survey work of the people who were involved um, and found it was really positive. Asked all those people to come into City Hall um, to make this happen. Again, it, it was, um, I literally had to set up a phone uh, you know, you could call in. We had four students full time for three months answering people's complaints for the, when we first put it in. But then it went off. And then the, it just, it changed overnight. So we had to make this change as part actually of the franchise agreement with all of those. Um, and if you want more information, I can pass you on to people that want to do it. Hi. Um, hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs are. Um, uh, very potent greenhouse gases, thousands of times more potent than carbon dioxide. And they're used as refrigerants in refrigerators, freezers, air conditioners, including vehicle uh, air conditioners. Um, does the uh, Portland um, Climate Action Plan um, include any ways to uh, help prevent or reduce uh, emissions of HFCs to the atmosphere? There's. Um, uh I'd say this is one of my uh, dirty little secrets about Portland is that besides, be, yes, there are a few things in the plan, um, you know, that are more like promote that's not regulatory because we can't do it from local government very well. Um, we don't have an air quality department, so we have the whole city, and neither is the county because we have a state department of environmental quality, and they sort of trump all of the stuff that we're doing. But um, doesn't mean we can't have one. And so I think that there's a whole lot of issues around air quality, um, and those are all very personal, and people understand that a whole lot better than they do climate. Um, so 
it's one of the things that I really want Portland to work on is focusing more on local air quality and, and those kinds of things that, that make a bigger uh, impact. Thank you. I'll ask a technical question too. About 10 years ago, the National League of Cities had a convention in Portland, and one of the things we looked at were green roofs, and there were three generations of green roofs. The most, uh, the oldest one was on a county building, the newest one was on the library roof. So, green roofs versus reflective roofs. What's, uh, what's, your, what's your theory? So, me personally, um, in Portland, uh, stormwater runoff is such a huge issue. Um, that from a water perspective, um, I think it's, it's a key issue. It doesn't mean you need to do an eco roof or a green roof. I mean, there's lots of other things you could do on site. So in theory, you could do both. You can have some reflective um, things. We don't, um, Heat Island is becoming a more important issue in the Northwest. Um, and I think having reflective roofs is a part of that. We have um, also solar, so there's a lot of competition for that roof space. Um, so I think there's opportunities if you're gonna if you're gonna have an ordinance like that to allow people trade-offs um, And so I, we did that for solar and uh, for eco roofs. Great question Hi uh, The the idea of doing energy ratings for houses that are going on the market is absolutely terrific Who does those ratings? Okay, so there's actually um, We're using a federal Department of Energy sort of uh, format for doing. We personalized it a little bit. Uh, we then did training for a whole lot of people. So there's a whole lot of people with some more work. If they're not that expensive, they're running $150 to $250. Um, they're standardized so that you're doing the, the same. Um, it's kind of like a, an energy audit, but it's, uh, it's a little bit more than that. Um, and so people are also getting recommendations on the changes that need to be made. And um, it's something that's comparable and it also really helped um, provide some jobs for really basic um, kind of entry-level jobs in construction. Hello. Uh, <clears throat> regarding the uh, uh, objective of bringing a big percentage of people closer to their everyday destinations, I understand that includes uh, bike lanes and uh, uh, sidewalks and things. Was there ever a discussion of uh, modifying residential zoning to bring destinations closer to the where people live, like uh, stores and maybe jobs? Absolutely. Um, so for the past five years, um, I've been working on something called the uh, Residential Infill Project, also known as RIP, which is not a good, <laughs> <laughs> which is what, uh, a lot of people would like uh, it to be. Um, and it's focusing on allowing on any 5,000 square foot traditional. So a lot of the city, especially that yellow part of the city that I showed on that map, Central City, and, and some of the edges of that are 5,000 square foot lots. So allowing on a 5,000 square foot lot a home, we already allow um, accessory dwelling units. So ADUs have been allowed for uh, many, many years. Um, and we have, they don't pay um, additional. Um, um, assessment and property tax when they're built. So that's another, and they don't pay, uh, usually, um, and they don't pay the system development charges and just as a different unit. So that's for ADUs. Um, the proposal right now that's just made it through the Planning and Sustainability Commission would allow on any um, single family lot um, a duplex in any lot and up to two more ADUs. So up to four units on any lot. So if you're just new to this, never heard that before, um, and you're right, someone who lives in my neighborhood, for example, um, very upset about it. But then you see it in practice, and you see what can happen. And we begin to hear stories about um, you know, the single mom who actually could then move into a really great elementary school district who could never be there otherwise. The only way they could be there is to be in, a, on an, in an apartment with kids right on the main road. And so um, we're looking at that heartily. Um, Seattle, Vancouver, uh, half dozen other cities, all of the planning directors, we've been working on this um, together. So again, I know you're, you're, you think you're talking about climate and energy and it's gonna be all about the utilities, but land use is a really key part of all this. Thanks. One last question. I have a question, not so a technical question, but rather around community engagement. Um, I was struck by your having those middle school um, events. That was really, I thought, a good distribution <laughs> in terms of education. I was wondering if you could say something about whether there's any, uh, whether the involvement or absence of involvement on the interfaith community and universities 
uh, academic uh, faculty or students made any difference? Um, they've all been really involved, um, especially early on. So, you know, picture me in 1993. Um, and uh, uh, the first groups I went to were like Physicians for so Social Responsibility. Um, so yay for any <laughs> physicians in the house here. And um, uh, the University of Portland State University, University of Portland, Oregon State, um, University of Oregon, uh, they actually helped us do a lot of the um, original uh, uh, technical work on putting together all the numbers. And so um, absolutely important and a key part of our work, and we continue to have them be a part of our um, engagement. Thank you. So let's give Susan a really big hand. Normally at this hour in a second Saturday morning of every month, many of us in the room and the rest of you who aren't should be uh, are at a citizen climate lobby meeting, which is uh, typically the second Saturday for most of the CCL groups. And so we have taken their meeting time this month, and they have uh, very graciously cooperated. And to uh, tell you all who don't know what CCL, Citizens Climate Lobby, is all about, I'm very happy to introduce one of the dynamos in the CCL effort, uh, Gwen Hansen, who uh, leads the CCL Bellevue Group. and. She, along with Ian James, standing next to her, Ian is running the Issaquah Group, are going to tell you what CCL is all about. So let's give them a warm welcome. Hi. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking all of you, because I know it's beautiful outside, and we all want to be in the sunshine, but thank you for being here, and a huge thank you to Court for starting People for Climate Action, and to Susan Anderson for that amazing presentation. Thank you so much. So, an anonymous person said, a vision without a task is but a dream. A task without a vision is drudgery. A vision and a task together are the hope of the world. So a lot of very smart people like Susan Anderson um, dismiss federal action with a footnote. I, I get that. I totally get that. But some of us have a vision of federal action anyway. And the myriad things that Portland is doing and this, uh, this, the uh, uh, just transition, job retraining, better equity, those things are hugely important. And what we want to do in Citizens Climate Lobby is put wind in the sails of all of those efforts. Citizens Climate Lobby was founded by Marshall Saunders, whose career was anti-poverty. For decades, that's all he did. The only reason he founded Citizens Climate Lobby after his illustrious and successful work in eradicating world poverty is because he felt that climate change was going to start to undo the good work he had previously done. He needed to find effective climate action at the federal level. So our mission is to build the political will for a livable world. And you might ask, what is political will? And it's basically, we, any smart legislators are going to look back home to see if people support any policies that will make them stick their neck out. So before we can get legislators to say yes on climate action, they have to know that they have a community of supporters behind them. And that's what we're trying to help them achieve. So our solution to climate change is that we still believe in democracy. So um, how many people here think that Congress is absolutely doing the will of the people day in and day out? <laughs> mm, OK. Uh, how many people here think that there are members of the United States Congress that fervently want to do the will of the people? Yay. OK. Well, those are the guys that really like us. Because <laughs> instead of assuming that, that the United States Congress is broken beyond all repair, 
we look for the goodness in people. We look for their better instincts, and we try to help develop those. And um, I have a quote from Carlos Corbello. So um, does, has anybody heard of Carlos Corbello? OK, some of you have. He's a Republican lawmaker from the state of Florida, and he was one of the first people to join the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus, which brought Republicans and Democrats together to a safe place to talk about climate. And he was, um, so he's been instrumental, and he was recently not, he's now no longer in Congress, but before he left, he said that he has had many conversations with Republicans from all over the country, even the Deep South, and he said that they are, really ready to move on this issue, and they're tired of the hyper-politicization um, and demagoguery that's been allowing the disingenuous to hijack the truth. He said that the Republican lawmakers around this country are building the courage to move forward, and we are here to help them. So our mission, okay, so Citizens Climate Lobby has over 100,000 volunteers around the world, most of them in the United States and Canada. And Canada recently enacted our policy, which we're gonna tell you more about in a second. So we have 100,000 volunteers. Um, that sounds like a lot, it's not that many, there's lots of organizations that have more. The reason we're at 100,000 is because we are a transformational rather than a transactional organization. Um, what that means is that instead of just asking people to donate or to attend a rally, we develop our volunteers. So we, uh, just as an example, so I've got uh, Ian, James, Ian James standing next to me. So he was a member of my group, a very nice member, just, just coming to meetings, and that was awesome. He also had an electric leaf before a lot of people I know. So super guy, super great guy. And now what is he? He's the co-leader of the Issaquah group, along with Elaine Armstrong. Elaine, if you could stand up too. So, yay. So, so, yeah, this is the kind of amazing transformations that we see. I mean, I could, I could go on and on uh, with other volunteers in this room, actually. So, um, so um, to, just to let you know, um, for 10 years, we've been working on a carbon fee and dividend policy. And as I said, we were born out of a desire to have equality, you know, more equality and, and get people out of poverty. Um, so our policy was that we would tax carbon emissions and return the money that's raised by that to people. We finally, after 10 years of hard work, our bill was introduced, bipartisan introduction in 2018 in both the Senate and the House of Representatives of the United States. Yes, <laughs> it's true. Um, and then it has been reintroduced in the House of Representatives in 2019, again, bipartisan. And it's, we're hoping it's going to be reintroduced in the Senate soon. And I want you all to know a little bit about what this bill is about. It's, it's not going to replace the 50 things that they're doing in Portland. Or, excuse me, I know it's more than 50, pardon me. Um, it's, going to, it's going to be one policy that's going to put the wind in the sails of all the other policies. Um, it's effective. This is an extremely strong climate policy. It will lower emissions 40% in the next 12 years. It's also good for people. Um, as Susan said, we, I mean, just lowering pollution immediately improves people's health, and it will save lives. It will also create 2.1 million jobs over the next 10 years. And last but not least, as we mentioned, it is bipartisan. It has support on both sides of the aisle. Right, so here are all uh, your members of Congress in the House that are sponsors and co-sponsors of the current uh, carbon fee and dividend uh, proposal. Um, this is uh, HR 763, and look, look at all these people here. Now, you might, if you look closely, you'll see that they are almost all Democrats. Um, and, and this might be a bit discouraging, but you have to remember that the support for um, d climate action is really strong across all uh, political spectrums. Um, more than 60% of Trump voters support taxing and or regulating global warming pollution. That's 62% of Trump voters. Um, and, and more than half of Republicans and over two thirds of moderate Republicans support a carbon tax. So the support there is there. It's just the it's just the leaders. We have to work on the leaders and show them that 
this is what we want. And uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, poll data I'm, I'm telling you about came from the Yale Climate Opinion Studies uh, in 2018. Okay, and uh, now, uh, citizens' climate lobby and other activists, grassroots activism, it really works. If you remember the presidential election uh, 2016, uh, cl climate wasn't even a topic of the debates. Um, and like a couple of years ago, nobody was talking about carbon fee and dividend. And now, it's right one of the top issues. And in fact, all these candidates here are supporting uh, carbon fee and dividend. Booker, Buttigieg, <laughs> Delaney, <laughs> Andrew Yang uh, actually support carbon fee and dividend. And, and, and all of these others are, are favorable for a carbon tax or willing to consider it. So this is fantastic progress. So, you know, what we're doing really works. Thank you, Ian. Um, Okay, so um, I'd like everybody in this room who's a member of Citizens Climate Lobby to please stand up. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> okay, so there's a bunch of us. And why are we here? We're supposed to be working on national. Well, the reason we're here is because Citizens Climate Lobby provides a really great structure for action. What they do is they tell you to have monthly meetings on the second Saturday. They tell you to provide snacks for the people, if possible. <laughs> they also prepare an agenda for you so that you have some really good things to do. They also have a lot of, they teach you a lot of different things. As I said, we're transformational. So there's a lot of education about how to communicate, how to write an effective letter to the editor, how to meet with your lawmaker. And so as a result of that, People, are passion, people that are passionate about climate getting together in the same room every month, well, guess what? They do lots of things. They don't just do national legislation. So we, in our group, we work really hard at national legislation, state efforts, and city efforts. Um, in fact, I, I first heard about uh, People for Climate Action at a meeting at my house that was a Citizens Climate Lobby meeting. So it's like we all working together, but this provides a great structure. So this is a um, picture of every one of the meetings in my house. This is my cul-de-sac. And you can see all the electric cars and bicycles that my neighbors have to put up with on the second Saturday of every month. We are a force to be reckoned with right there. So. All right, so what are the next steps? Well, um, as we saw in the previous presentation, there are like lots and lots of uh, solutions to climate change. And uh, you know, everybody may have their own favorite thing that they want to do, or they may be affili affiliated with a particular group. But we have to remember we're all allies and we're all pulling together. Um, you know, we together, each of us did a little bit to cause climate change, and together we can, you know, each of us does a little bit, we can solve it together as well. So, uh, you know, um, remember, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and just every, uh, every month, you know, just if you commit to just doing one thing, just keep on pushing forward, you know, calling, calling your representatives or writing letters to the editor, uh, just, just keep climate on the foreground, and um, to, you know, together, anything we do is gonna is gonna help. And that's it. Thank that's you it. so much. So we want to share some uh, recent good news with you, and then take a look ahead. And uh, Megan Smith with. King County's going to help me do that in a couple minutes, but first a uh, few good news things. I don't know if you're aware that uh, Yale and uh, George Mason University have together for the past decade or so done a sampling of public opinion nationally. This is the record. Red is not so good. Blue is pretty good showing uh, people's concern and interest in the climate change problem. Notice what happened here in December of 2018. A big spike up, highest it's ever been, 
72% of the general public across the nation is concerned now. That's a pretty big sea change. Things are changing more and more rapidly as a consequence. That's pretty good news. We've seen this chart early today about our emissions countywide in King County. Um, the good news on this chart is we peaked with our greenhouse gas emissions back in 2010. Now, they're not coming down real fast, but at least we peaked. And we're here today to figure out how we get them moving down a lot faster, like Portland has been doing. I want to talk for a little bit about what has been happening at the county level, because we're a county-level organization, People for Climate Action is, and we're allied with and supporting the K4C, the King County Cities Climate Collaboration. And there's been a lot happening. It helps to account for why we peaked previously in our greenhouse gas emissions. So we all need to realize this is a really, really complicated subject, and nobody has all the answers. All of us are on a learning curve. Portland's been on that learning curve a lot longer than most of the rest of us, which is why they found so many solutions already and why their emissions are coming down. But our elected officials and staff are trying. And they're going to try harder, and they're going to find more resources if we keep reminding them that that's what we want. So let's just look real quickly at some of the things that has, have been accomplished in the last two years. The, the county's been uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the county operations, doing a good job of that. They've developed a clean electricity pathway study about two years ago that's available. They've got an inventory of greenhouse gases countywide. They've hosted work groups for fleet managers to clean up those fleets. They've stepped up their efficiency improvement revolving loan fund. That's a pretty big deal. They are, they've set up a loan fund for local governments, cities, to borrow funds to do energy efficiency improvements. So that helps all of us along in our various cities. They've organized green building tools events to help inform the public. They've been ambitiously electrifying their uh, metro bus fleet. A lot of us have seen them around our neighborhoods. They've helped, along with a lot of other folks, to get some really strong climate legislation passed this year. That's been a big step. Just recently, they developed uh, the first local forest carbon credit program in the country. They've been convening since K4C started, actually, five years ago, uh, elected officials, summit meetings twice a year. And they've expanded that King County City's climate collaboration from the first 12 five years ago to now 16, and most of those last four were just added in the last two years. So that's, that's another really big deal. So these are the 16 that we now have, and if your city's not on there with a star, um, we have people in the room that can help you get there. So let's look ahead now, and I'd like to introduce Megan Smith who's uh, one of the key figures in getting the K4C uh, going where it's been going. And uh, I see Rachel Bromberg is, is here with her. Rachel's uh, active in that as well. So, Megan, come on up and tell us more of your story. The down arrow advances. Uh... Down arrow. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for having me here today. 
Um, I want to first say thank you. I love how you organize this event. I loved when I came in that you have people signing in by area. So you are bringing so many people together, connecting people across communities and within communities. And I love that. Um, I love the snack practices of the, the, that we have here today. Um, and, you know, as I listen to Susan, we are similar in so many ways, and we actually have used Portland as a model and learned from them. We definitely beg, borrow, and steal from other local governments. Um, and I'll touch on a few of those similarities as I go through this very, very quickly. So for King County, um, our 2015 Strategic Climate Action Plan is really our blueprint for climate action. And we, and I, you know, Susan was taking off the areas that they cover in their Portland plan, and there are a lot of similarities here. Um, and ours is broken into two sections, reducing emissions and preparing for climate impacts. And in those areas, we work very comprehensively. Uh, something Susan said that really hits home for me is land use planning, transportation mobility are absolutely important. Uh, for me, they are foundational to our success or failure in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, especially at the community scale. So for transportation and land use, you know, for each of these areas, we have goals, targets, measures, and priority actions. So we lay out what do we need to do to reduce the emissions from that sector, and what are we measuring against over time? How do we make course corrections? So for example, on transportation and land use, one of our, our targets in our plan is that we focus 98% of new development in King County within established urban areas. So think about King County, 2.2 million residents, 39 cities working together to focus that growth in urban areas. We are, on, we are meeting that goal. And that is essential to be able to serve our areas with transit and reduce emissions from the transportation sector. Um, in building and facilities energy, uh, something I think a lot of people don't know about King County, you know, first we very much also have that ethos of efficiency first. So Court mentioned we have a loan fund for cities. We've also established an internal loan fund. So we can basically take funds, have the upfront capital costs for our county agencies to invest in energy efficiency, and then pay off the loan with the energy savings. So with that program, you know, we save about three and a half million dollars a year every year because we've invested in that efficiency. And kind of a little known fact, um, at our wastewater treatment plants, we capture biogas. We sell it for transportation fuel. That's what we do at our South Wastewater Treatment Plant in Renton. We also ca capture gas at our Cedar Hills landfill. We produce renewable energy that exceeds what King County uses to run our government operations. So it's, it's a big deal. Um, we also generate quite a bit of revenue doing that. Uh, think about over five million a year down at our South treatment plant. We take that money and we reinvest it in things that save energy and reduce emissions. On the green building front, uh, two weeks ago, we certified our first net zero energy building. So that's a building where uh, it produces more energy from solar than it uses in the building. That's one of our parks maintenance facilities. We've committed to do another 10 of those facilities uh, in the next two years. Consumption and materials management, thank you. Um, that gets to things like waste reduction, recycling, looking at food production, you know, what are, what, what are the emissions associated with all the things we buy, use, use, recycle, and dispose of. Um, and as Susan mentioned, that's a really big source of emission that often people don't think about. Forest and agriculture, how we develop on our landscape, how we conserve forests that capture carbon, you know, how we have land use patterns over the landscape that can match with transit. Um, and reduce emissions over time is also really important. So that's also a key part of our plan. And then we also have a section on preparing for climate impacts. This gets into things like working with University of Washington Climate Impacts Group to look at how are storm patterns changing over time, looking at sea level rise, how do we need to make sure our critical services we provide, like wastewater treatment, how do we make sure those things are resilient to climate impacts? And then when we work in communities, how do we make sure the people who are most impacted by poor air quality, uh, sea level rise, flooding, who maybe have the least resources to address those issues, how do we make sure that those communities are resilient as well? <clears throat> um, just one other thing I want to mention here. For all these actions, we work at two scales. So Susan called it, you know, kind of the walking the talk. 
what are we doing in government operations, and then what are we doing at the community scale in partnership with cities. Okay, so what's next? How do we move faster at the community scale? So we feel like we've seen some good progress on reducing per capita emissions, down about 8% in King County. But as you can see, everywhere you go in King County, very rapid growth. How do we still continue to bring those emissions down with a growing population? And that means you know, really, really focusing in on what are our sources of emissions and what can we do about them. So I just, I put this up here, this work, we call this the wedge analysis. Uh, this was foundational to our 2015 Strategic Climate Action Plan, and it is very foundational to our King County Cities Climate Collaboration that Court mentioned. So 16 city members plus the Port of Seattle. This, we looked at this and we said, if we want to get on track, I'm going to step away from the microphone for a sec. If we just keep tracking along business as usual, population group, it's very simplified, our emissions will continue to increase. What are the pathways to get us on a trajectory to an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050? So we did this work actually back in 2014. Um, and we looked at kind of the categories. What will we get out of corporate uh, or federal fuel economy standards? What do we get out of the renewable portfolio standard in Washington State? How far can we get with reducing vehicle miles traveled? getting people out of their single occupancy vehicles into other great options like transit and bicycling. Um, and one that was incredibly important was how do we get to cleaner electricity supplies? It was very clear to us we cannot meet our climate and energy goals for King County, nor can the cities, our shared goals to the King County Cities Climate Collaboration, we can't get there without clean electricity supplies. So that really informed us in where do we focus our actions together. And a lot of folks today have talked about informing policy. That is incredibly important. So we put a lot of effort as K4C into influencing the state legislation this year. So that 100% clean electricity package, building energy efficiency, appliance efficiency. Uh, we went after cleaner vehicles and fuels. Didn't get all of that, but it was an incredibly transformational legislative session. And our elected officials in K4C, and I want to list a few names here, uh, Councilmember Bruce Bassett from Mercer Island, uh, Will, Mayor Will Hall from Shoreline, Deputy Mayor Jay Arnold from Kirkland, Mayor Larson from Snoqualmie, Councilmember Claudia Balducci from King County, Councilmember Nancy Tosta from Burien. So representatives from all over the county, they went down, they testified many times in front of those committees saying, local governments want cleaner energy, we want better building efficiency, we're ready to stand up for this. So that was really important. So, Court is wanting me to get to what's next. So the thing I really want to highlight is, so we have our 2015 Strategic Climate Action Plan. We are now doing our five-year update. And that's an opportunity for all of you to get involved in that. And so we are working on our 2020 Strategic Climate Action Plan. We are right now, we've hired a consultant to update our emissions inventory. So what are our sources of emissions? What are now our best pathways to reduce them? And then where do we, this is so important, working with King County Cities Climate Collaboration, where do we focus our efforts, you know, shared actions to have the most impact? Kind of what, what's our next wave of actions to influence policy and inform local actions by our governments? And how do we measure progress and ensure accountability? Um, just as, I will just wave it, because we're not going to go through it. We both have our climate action plan, our current one. It's available online at kingcounty.gov slash climate. And then we report publicly every two years on our progress. That is also at the same website. So I want people to know there's those accountability frameworks, both for county operations and at the community scale. Um, we are now reviewing and learning from other climate plans, like Portland's. We're involved in networks, networks like Local Governments for Sustainability um, and the United States Sustainability Directors Network. I want to say in our 2020 plan, we have two sections now, reducing emissions, preparing for impacts. We are adding a third section, really central, that is more focused on what do communities need and want? What are their concerns? What are their priorities? Um, and very much following the model of Portland, creating a climate equity steering committee to help guide those community recommendations and have that guidance coming from people of color, people who are in community-based community organizations, um, 
helping provide services to low-income residents in King County. So that will be really central to our plan. Okay, next. Okay, for King County City's climate collaboration, uh, areas of joint focus I want to highlight. So the first one is engaging in the state session. Uh, that is done, and now our task is making sure those fantastic bills and policies get implemented. So our attention turns to things like weighing in on integrated resource plans for utilities, making sure that great incentives for energy efficiency and electric vehicles get out and get designed in a way that people can access them. Um, we, I mentioned we're hiring a consultant to map those pathways, and we're also hiring a consultant uh, to support our K4C members. How can we accelerate getting to net zero energy commercial building, net zero carbon emission buildings? What are the codes we need? What are the incentives? We don't want each city to have to reinvent the wheel. How can we work on that together? Um, we are engaged in national building energy code updates. That's really foundational to our energy efficiency here in King County. Uh, we've got our consultant on board to update our emissions inventory, I already mentioned. Um, and we want to update our K4C goals and priority actions by the end of December, so we can weave those into the county's climate plan. Um, and then this last one here is we want to get out to city councils. We want to bring a lot of this information out into communities. I feel like we have not done a good enough job of that, so that is also a commitment for us. And then um, for this Strategic Climate Action Plan update, I'd really encourage you to join our listserv for updates and workshop notices. Uh, we have a postcard. Unfortunately, we don't have enough for the entire room, but it looks like this. I think Rachel has put it up on the sign-up table out there. Um, it has information about how you can get involved in our plan update. Um, we're going to have topic-based workshop for key action areas like building energy efficiency. Um, and we'll have three public meetings in October. And I'm going through this way too fast right now. What I would love and what I would offer is I would love to do a presentation and workshop with you uh, focused on actions in King County, mirroring what you heard today from Portland. I would be very happy to do that. So. <clears throat> And then um, I also wanted to say, going back to that connection with land use, our King County Comprehensive Plan is being updated right now. We are looking at all our, po our policies and regulations related to fossil fuel infrastructure. So that is things like, well, and actually coal mining, uh, oil terminals, oil transport, all those things we're looking at, all our land use regulations, our policies, and our permitting. So if that's something you're interested in, six public meetings in July on that. I really encourage you to get involved. Our comprehensive plan is where we have our urban growth boundary. It's always important to have that political will to hold the line on that urban growth boundary and focus growth in the established urban areas and not sprawl out. Uh, the other thing we have that you can get engaged in is we have a carbon neutral implementation plan. That is getting at how do we go farther and faster in reducing emissions from county government. That is now in our council, Mobility Environment Committee, uh, and they will be looking at that on May 21st. So that's another opportunity to get involved. Um, I think that's all I have. <laughs> we have Court come back up here, thank you. All right. Okay, so I'm going to take you home here <clears throat> in a couple of minutes. We want to think beyond this year. We have to do a lot in a short time, but it goes beyond 2019. We need to get our trajectory on greenhouse gas emissions going down as fast or faster than Portland because we have to catch up. We're not going to hit the goal that was set by the K4C five years ago for 2020, we're not going to have emissions down by 25% using a 2007 baseline. But that doesn't mean we can't hit the 2030 goal of 50% down. So let's keep that in mind. And the one beyond in 2050, 80% down. So, <laughs> it's the fourth quarter, two minutes left on the clock, we're behind. 
we got to do some good huddling and come up with some extraordinary plans. We're doing a lot, but we're not doing enough. We've started with the K4C, quite a few good things there, the first three. We're measuring our greenhouse gas emissions, at least in many of our cities. But we've really got to develop our plans in a much more robust fashion. Remember, Portland has 171 actions in their plan. We're doing a lot, but not 171 things, and it probably could do more than 171. Then we have to implement that plan, and then we've got to frequently review it. But when we do this planning, we have 39 cities in King County. Each city doing their own climate action plan does not make a whole lot of good sense, either economically or from a, a resource standpoint. So we need to collaborate a whole lot more. We need to get some kind of agreeable template for all of our cities to follow. And those of us in People for Climate Action are saying, that Portland plan looks like a pretty good starting template for us to create a county-wide plan that cities can follow to do individual actions in each city that are similar, are similar to the actions being done in all of our other cities. So we need to do a lot more collaboration, and the K4C format is probably the best way to bring all of our cities together. That's what we think in the People for Climate Action. So we've got to accelerate and to collaborate. <laughs> Together we can do this if we get all our oars in the water and we call the shots so we're all pulling at the same time. Now, thank you. I'm the Board of Health Commissioner Fred Feldman, and I'm just wondering whether you work with any of your local Portland Air Force supporters. Yeah, we do. Um, although they have some great staff, so I, I wouldn't say that we're helping them technically. Um, the, uh, the airport, in particular, has um, had a really robust sustainability, broader sustainability program. Um, and they're stepping in to, like a lot of airports, and then the port itself, which is huge on the um, There's all sorts of different things about plugging in uh, ships, uh, electrification, so they're not going to use all those things that are now kind of becoming normal. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, are there, I mean, lots of jurisdictions say that they have climate action plans. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of entity that is out there sort of accrediting <laughs> action plans and saying, no, this is an action plan because it includes X, Y, and Z principles. This just includes a lot of actions without maybe any goals, any you know, benchmarks, you know, no uh, accountability. Is there, is there anybody that's doing that kind of work so that uh, electeds, like me, <laughs> can't get away with saying that they did something when that something doesn't actually have those elements in them. So, um, Cities for Climate Change, ICLAI, has a protocol. Um, we don't actually, they don't certify and stamp, you know, but there's a protocol for having emissions, you know, you know, inventory and all of those kinds of things. So I think all that is really helpful. There's a group called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network um, that may you know, sort of go have all traded information. Um, so there's no certification.
congestion price. And you know, there wasn't any discussion there. I, I, I guess I'm just curious, you know, what's the status of the discussion of that in Portland and just what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So um, it's moving forward, um, looking at both, uh, especially between our two local states, I-5 uh, and 205 potentially, um, and, you know, different time of day charges. Um, we had state legislation that sort of enabled us to do that. We're doing it on a metro scale. So we have metro, which is, I think, the only metro or regional government, elected government in the U.S. So we have actual elected officials to a metro government that represent all 23 cities and three counties. And they do transportation change everything when we did that, because otherwise you're all doing your own plans. I mean, you have your other the transit uh, connection. So, um, big worries, of course, are, you know, lower income families, what do they do? They have to do their car, they have to drive. There's no bus service to get from this part of town when they go to the industrial drive. So, um, lots of information that you want to connect with those people. Hi. Um, <coughs> So uh, I noticed that when you brought up the uh, agricultural aspect, basically, uh, reducing the amount of animal food that you eat, uh, I was kind of surprised because that actually um, impacts a very small part of our climate. Uh, I mean, we think of agriculture as this big, huge group of farms with actually 90% of still in the world in the country. And um, I looked it up, and there's only like 9% uh, of the impact of greenhouse gas emissions coming from agriculture. Um, and my concern is that by adding something like that into a climate plan, we may reduce the impact of things that actually impact our greenhouse gas emissions much more highly, like transportation and electricity generation, and kind of give excuses maybe to some parts of our government and our corporations to not reduce those as much as they really should. Okay. So 9% or there's other numbers, you know, floating around, but no, it's not 40% or something like that. But we need it all. Um, and when you look at consumption-based uh, focus, right, there's so many things that we do and what we buy and how we eat and, you know, the things that we purchase. It's supposed to be where we can buy or all of those things have an impact and that is real. And so we just think it's really important to educate people about that. Um, we're not not telling people to see what we need to do, but um, it's important for people on a personal scale to feel like it's just like recycling. Recycling is not the most important environmental thing to do, but everybody can do it. And so they feel like they're a part of this movement, and it's sort of like how the entryway, the drag or something is like, you know, recycle them, it's like, oh, then you can go back to the and help them to distribute them. Can I just take a nap on that real quick? Uh, one of the things that most of us don't realize is there's a big sequestration potential in uh, what's going on with agriculture with all the chemicals that we use for destroying the microbes in the soils and those microbes and other things in the soil have as much potential for sequestration as all our forests. So though we aren't necessarily emitting more than 9%, we're avoiding sequestration that could be done if we had the right agricultural uh, processes in place. So that, and the cities can't know a whole lot about that except for the consumer. And if you're buying organic, for the most part, uh, and eating organic, then you're uh, providing opportunity for those natural organisms to do that sequestration. We talked about K4C here being an entity that's trying to work together because it's the cities, um, I think the equivalent of Portland, but just Seattle itself. I'm curious whether there's any sort of equivalent uh, collaboration going on between the, the suburbs of Portland and Portland. Portland. Okay. Yeah, and how the county in Portland is yeah. working with it. So um, originally it was a city plan, and then in um, 2003 or two or something like that, um, we asked the county to join us. Um, for to kind of bring in the health impacts of the work we're doing. Um, there are probably four urban uh, so cities that have their own plans to so all kind of work together a little bit. There is a group, the US, USDN has the like, Urban Sustainability Directors Network, kind of has a Northwest group that they put that in front of the uh, together. Uh, I've been working with Metro, our Metro government, to say it is a crazy world. We're doing the bits and pieces here, and uh, so we do need people, the same thing we need people coming together in one place. Um, one of the reasons I think, I don't know how your state government works, but I know how ours works, pretty much, if we want something to pass.
Christine. I see okay. I'm David Barnes, Dave Kirkman. I'm a planner that's working on a sustainability master plan. Your presentation is super inspiring, so thank you. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about right now is sustainable government operations. And in that, uh, sustainable decision making, how to institutionalize decisions that government makes every day about their own pieces within the government using sustainability as a plan. Do you have any resources for that, or if you crack that nut in Portland, or that's what you're um, question. Yeah, a lot of the, yeah, I mentioned the Portland plan. Yeah. And so, um, a lot of that, to me, sustainability is really just, it's not about the environment. It's about, you know, the environment and jobs and people and all those things together, but it's really about long-term thinking. And, um, so part of what we did in that plan was look for um, alignment and try to understand, you know, here's here are the bigger, here's the bigger broader goals around um, what we call it for sustainability. And then here's all of your jobs and your transportation, your parks, your housing, and whatever, and kind of looking at to how those could align and then what kind of budget impacts could there be of, you know, instead of housing asking for this and transportation and something else, together they ask for something. So some of that really resulted quickly after the Portland plan. The problem with it now is, you know, like the change. I've gone through two years. You know, and, and so uh, the current, the, you know, when they're running for office, the first question after the, the plan was adopted was, you know, are you going to buy into this? Because a lot of mayors can say, that was the old mayor's plan. So there's nobody in. <laughs> That's so true. Uh, it was an enormous process. We had 17,000 people. The city um, through all sorts of social media and everything else. So um, I think uh, coming back at the end to I think the, the first question, which was about how do you get people interested, is talking about what they care about instead of coming to them and saying, you know, the city now has an official sustainability agenda and you need to be in housing and transportation, doing it the other way around. So I'm hoping to earn a seat on Seattle City Council. And one thing I'm really passionate about is what you had brought up with uh, garbage and recycling. Right. You had alluded to some franchise agreements. Can you share a little bit more in detail about what that looked like or how you achieved it or offer a website to go to to kind of sure, sure. I'm happy to pass on the name of people that, that can help you directly with that. But um, y'all probably have just one franchise with college, and that's it. That's easy. Um, and maybe. You know, whatever it is, yeah, the fuse, you know, the fuse. Um, ours were up, ours are up every 10 years, but it's fine. We have like a great you can get in on our tent thing, and we, we did it at that time, and um, we have to change the rules at that time around uh, rate of returns. And just, um, they will tell you they're a company, but I, mean, I look at them very utility and they're regulated utility, and we still get to make the rules. Uh, one of the things I noticed, uh, and yes, I, I agree with the presentation, is great. Uh, I, you mentioned electric vehicles, uh, but they really weren't called out uh, as, part, uh, as part of the uh, uh, reduction uh, in carbon emissions. And we know that it's transportation is something like, what, 30% of what we're doing. And EVs are three to four times more efficient than a gas power. Um, is, is that going to is, is that going to change in the next uh, the next iteration of the plan? Yeah, so it's a big part of the plan. It's just we have a real we call it the mobility pyramid or something. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so yeah, you, know, you want people to walk first or, or you know, you can go and then you're biking and then you know you're taking the bus or light rail and street car and at some point you're getting in a car. Yeah. If you're getting in a car, it's electric first. And so we have sort of this um, it's actually it is combined with our autonomous vehicle vehicle, um, which will be coming much faster than we think. It'll be coming first like my you know, for freight and things like that, but it's just moving through your city. But so you, know, you want it autonomous, you want it clean. Um, you want it to be electric and you want it to be shared. And so before you get to the car, the electric car, you're looking at, even though I know you, know, you just hear the word lift or Uber, you're 
because of all the negative things that have happened too. But if we did it right, um, we could have electric only lift in the bird and um, people not running cars and additional resources available. Uh, you are aware that they at least one more trip than, than what a private car does. That, no, that's, that, that, right. that's a math problem to solve. Right. It just needs to, exactly, and I think there's a huge um, group of people looking at how do you make it seamless? So you just say, I'm going to go from A to B. And I don't care. I'm going to go to the bus right now. I'm doing the walk or something. So that's, 